Good evening everyone, time for episode 3 of the Drums of Doom by me, starting on page 28 with a chapter entitled The Secret Way. Okay, we get back to our adventurers from the end of Kerr's Rage and we start anew. The Secret Way the shaft descended deep and dark, far beyond any reflected glimmerings of the sun. In case the rusty iron rings of the ancient ladder should fail them, they tied safety lines between themselves, using the techniques that Kerr had taught them. However, even after rigorously testing the ancient rings for safety with sharp kicks and mighty pulls, the old dwarven smithcraft still held strong and firm beneath their weight. Down, ever down they climbed, rung after rung, into the wet cold of under-earth. To a dwarf it was home, and the music of the stone vibrated with songs of life and hidden treasures. But to elves and men it was a place to be suffered, all but briefly, for nightmares could not long be held back in a land where no lights ever shone. Nevertheless, they now possessed a light of purpose all their own. It was a binding cord between them, giving them the courage to stand, to walk, to go on. Kalo stopped their descent to investigate several mining shafts intersecting their own, but he found them all empty save for one, which bore several carts filled with ore-bearing rock, rotten and abandoned. He wondered what had caused the miners to abandon such wealth. Mithril, Kerr said, examining some of it. It's only found in schist deposits like these. Do you see these distinctive crystalline layers? It is the character of the stone. I wonder why they'd leave this behind. Either they left it in a hurry, or they intended to come back for it and never made it. It's enough for a king's ransom. Use the scepter, Kalor, Carmen urged. Show us the way. Its light was bright and blinding. But ever its pull was downward, and always deeper into Moldrul's mountain. The shaft seems endless. I fear that some terrible doom awaits us. Fear not the pressing earth, Kerr said, for the dwarves were born here in ancient times, and although Moradeus forged us and gave us life with his own breath, the bowels of Tempest were our womb, and she holds us no ill will. You are like a great rock that a weary traveler might lean upon, Dow said. Without you, we would all be lost. I'm beginning to feel more at home down here, Kerr, Kalor said. I am told that some gnomes still live in the deep, dark places of the world. Despite their assurances, Carmen's breath grew shorter, and the weight of the walls kept pressing ever tighter. It was then that Kerr's firm grip shook her free of its fear with a, gra with a gasp. Remember that your sun still shines above us, Kerr said, and look there, the shaft has ended, and another intersecting tunnel lies just beneath us. Dropping down into the tunnel, he determined that it ran somewhat north to south. Standing for some moments, he listened for any signs of danger, but he heard nothing but the breathing of his companions above. Come down quietly, he whispered, the new tunnel runs for some distance. They all descended then, Carmen and Tarek, Leander and Dartin, Dao and Karina, and lastly Kalor, who was their lifeline with an extra rope from the tunnel above. I think that we should check the map, Carmen said, and risk a little light. A few moments later, Dao had a torch burning. Handing it to Dartin, he rummaged through his pack for his scroll case. Let me see, Dao said. Ah, oh, yes, the map shows this southern passage but not the North Tunnel. Perhaps the artist was only concerned with drawing where he'd come from. Or maybe it's a new addition, Dartin said. Let's try moving north a few paces, Carmen said, and discover how far it goes. Staying close together, they used the light of Dartin's torch to guide them. They crept ahead for some time, and in the end, we found only a great downward stairwell. completely flooded. 
Lying near the water's edge, a rotten and crumpled backpack rested, with the initials L.E. burned into its flap. Within it, they found the moldering remains of a long rope and a rusted grappling hook. I'll wager, Tarek said, that this belonged to the Vania that Modrul killed. If he was a god, Carmen said, then why, did, why didn't he just levitate up there or something? Maybe, Dao said, his divine powers were not available to him. It's a mystery, Kalos said, that only the dead can answer. Well, we can't go any farther this way, Karina said. We'll have to try the southern passageway or swim. Let's move, Carmen said. There's nothing else here. As they walked back, Tarek and Carmen talked quietly. Do you notice it, he asked. What? Our hardships have brought us together. We're moving together thinking together, and becoming a team. Let's hope it's enough. Traveling south, they eventually came to a westward and southeasterly bending passage. The west way ended quickly in a collapsed tunnel. I don't like it, Kerr said. Dwarven tunnels rarely collapse by themselves. However, the passages were very old, and the elements, even here, had an effect over time. It's no matter, Dow said. The map indicates that the southeast passage was the one that was used by the Vanir. This torch has almost had it. I'm going to put the map away before the light goes out. Let's rest here for a minute, Carmen said, until everyone's eyes have adjusted. Can you hear it, Leander said? It sounds like running water. Maybe a waterfall somewhere ahead. The map showed some sort of cave ahead, Dow said, and beyond it were more tunnels. We'll have to be extra careful, Leander said. Stormbringer says that ahead of us is a mighty torrent. He can't see very far, though, because his senses are dampened by the unending stone. Let's move out, Carmen said. Kalor, you're on point with Tarek. Descending further, the river's sounds became deafening, and speech was impossible. The passage soon ended in a great open chamber with a high ceiling, nearly beyond the reach of their height heat-sensitive eyes. A long, narrow ledge wound around the west wall, skirting a deep chasm below. Water rushed through the jagged gorge, as if it were blood pumped from the very heart of the world. Mist and waves sprayed up from below, careening off the cavern walls. Even the black stalactites above them were not immune to their touch. The ledge looked passable, yet treacherous. One slip into that tremendous flow would seal their fate. Tarek signaled for a withdrawal back to a quieter stretch of tunnel. Can we make it? Carmen asked. It looks slick, but most of the ledge is at least a foot wide and seems to span the entire length of the gorge. Kerr, what would you do? We'll need to rope off like we did on the mountain, only this time we'll all be tied together. And if we fall, then we fall as one. We should vote on it, Carmen suggested. It's risky. No need, Karina said. You should know by now that we're all in this until the end. Until the end, many of them echoed. Then rope off, Kerr said. Keep the rope taut. Step where I step, or where the soldier in front of you steps. Face the wall at all times. We must move together as one. Leading the way, Kerr began a crossing. Within seconds, the lashing spray drenched them. It seemed that the river itself wanted to suck them into its deadly embrace, but Kerr's footsteps were sure, and he tested each foothold carefully before committing his weight. On to it. <clears throat> if he found loose stones, he would signal to Carmen, who followed him and she to Dartin, and so on, and in this manner they finally reached the end of the great ledge. Victory was within their reach, but fate's fickle hand was present in the form of a circular portal blocking their passage. It was bound in iron, with wooden timbers swollen by moisture. Age had rusted its hinges fast. Its hinges fast. Carmen signaled for him to try the door, and in doing so, Kerr somehow stepped upon a shifting stone, and lo, a great gas poured out from the wall, engulfing him and the next three in line behind him. What a fool am I not to have known it, he thought, but
but it was too late. The dwarves who had built these lonesome mines had done so with great cunning. Secret traps and constricted passageways, easily defensible by only a handful of warriors, guarded each entryway into their kingdom. The ledge and chasm was just such an obstacle. Kerr now knew that he should have been looking for a trap. The thought came too late, because he had already inhaled enough of the poisonous vapors to kill most humans. The only action that he could manage before collapsing was to aim his fall toward the ledge before him and not into the falls below. Carmen braced herself. Tarek and Dartin crumpled behind her. Her helmet seemed to be protecting her from the dreadful gas, but dashed on the rocks below, such benefits would be of little use. Somehow, miraculously, her feet found a firm hold, and only Tarek and Dartin fell over the, over the edge. They dangled helplessly, limp, tangled, and unconscious. Luckily, Leander had followed D'Artin because only his strength was equal to the task of maintaining his footing and catching the weight, the falling weight of two men. He was all that he could manage alone. Hand tendons stressed to the limit, he cried out against the pain of the effort. His strength was holding, but he could not lift them even an inch. Now the rope was both a lifeline and the potential ruin of them all. Carmen fought against it discovering an inner strength that she never knew that she had. Struggling, she and Leander strained with all their might, but the angle was all wrong, and they could not raise them. She saw Leander's distress, and he hers, and they knew that the next few seconds would decide their fate. Behind Leander, the rest of the party was pulling back against the rope to help anchor them. It was a stalemate with no easy solution. To resign meant death. Only Kalor, the last in line, was free to act, one small gnome among so many tall folk. He had watched the scene unfold like a child at play with dominoes. The door was their greatest hope. Here and now, his size was a great boon, for he could pass around the legs of his comrades without falling from the ledge. Courageously, he cut himself free from the safety line and made his way around them. Quick and nimble, he stepped and climbed, swung and hopped, until he stood next to Kerr's body. Carmen looked down at him, but her face was invisible behind the shield of her mask. Her limbs trembled uncontrollably. He knew that there was no time. Swinging his pack off his shoulders, he pulled out his own rope, lashed one end to a large iron ring that was set in the wall and tested its strength. It held. Turning, he formed a noose and swung it about his head like a plains cattle wrangler. Repeatedly, he threw until the lucky toss settled it over Tarek's head and over and under one of his arms. Pulling carefully, Tarek had T Kalor had Tarek caught, supporting him with two ropes. He took in the slack and tied it off. Signaling to Carmen and Leander, he urged them to shuffle toward him. They soon understood his plan. By moving toward him, they were slowly lowering their comrades until Kalor's rope was withstanding the worst of the weight, and they could finally rest. You've got to get us through that door, Carmen shouted in his ear. We have to get them off this ledge. Hurry, Kalor. I think that they are going to die. After examining the door, he realized that its noxious, noxious gas was expended, its trap sprung. Finding no other dangers, he went to work upon the lock. It was rusted and worn, but its inner parts were well oiled. In seconds, he was able to unlock it with a few assorted picks and tools. Grasping the doorknob, he turned it and pushed, but the swollen door would not budge. Its timbers were thick, its iron well forged, and even the strongest lumberjack would require hours to hack through it. It's swollen shut. I can't push it open. <clears throat> if their fate had rested in his hands alone... Then his injured friends would surely have perished, but he was not alone. In an instant, Carmen had joined his side. While he had worked the door, she had managed to tie her own rope off to the same ring and join him. With strength born of desperation, she threw herself against the portal of body and soul. Left shoulder, hands and arms against it, her feet firmly planted against the cavern floor and wall. She screamed against it, her tendons straining to the breaking point. When it did not immediately budge, 
She didn't lose hope, but rather strove harder. And it was then that she heard a strange music, perhaps a chant, perhaps a song. It was one of battle, of carnage, of power, of pride, and it seemed to issue forth from the space all around her. Beneath its rhythm, she could hear a mighty breath, like the wind passing into a dragon's lungs. It fueled her spirit and granted her an unnatural strength that the door could not match. It groaned and slid until the rock that encased it crumbled and gave way. It was open. Before them loomed a short passageway, and beyond that, a spiral stair descended into the rock. Dragging Kerr's body into the alcove, they helped the others reach safety. Through a combined effort, they were able to pull their comrades out of the chasm. She examined them using the enhanced vision of her helmet. Their faces were pale and swollen, their breath only weak whispers. The river roared behind them, but they were finally safe for a moment, and Carmen was able to examine her injured friends. Tarek and Dartin seemed far worse than Kerr, whose breathing seemed to be improving steadily. It was a great mystery, because he had breathed in the most concentrated gas, being right next to the burst when it exploded. In a few minutes, he suddenly awoke, coughing wretchedly. You're alive! Drillin gas, he rasped. Nothing more. Drillin gas, Karina asked. Yes, it's made of sulfur and secret, li secret liquids, he said, wheezing. Against most, most animals, it's deadly. And for you, Carmen asked. It was weak with age. A strong batch would have killed us all. What of Tarek and Dartin? If they're not dead yet, they'll not die. I am Carmen, he said. Your helm is special indeed. I never smelled a thing. It's a good thing, too, Leander said, smiling. I don't think that I could have kept all four of you from falling. Chuckling, they finally began to relax after facing so much danger. I should have expected it, Kerr said with a final deep cough. We used drilling gas to protect our lower tunnels. And I was so worried about getting across that I never thought of it. We'll just have to be more careful next time, Leander said while pouring some water over his patient's swollen eyes. It's amazing how quickly you've recovered. You are nearly yourself while they, while they remain unconscious. My people are resistant to poison. Snake bites that would kill large creatures will only sicken most dwarves. My family is known to be particularly immune. What else can we do for them? I have dried mushrooms in my pack, Chris said. If we can make a tea from them, it will help their bodies purge the poison. But how to make a fire, Karina said. We're all drenched. We can use my lamp, Kalo said. There's still oil in it. And my trail cooking pot, Kerr said. Going to work, they prepared the tea. Now how do we get them to drink it, Karina said. We don't, Kerr said. Dip your fingers in the liquid and wipe it under their tongues. The tea itself is poisonous, but a small amount will heal and not kill. We should notice some improvement within minutes. They rested and worried. Their patients were irreplaceable, and to lose them now would surely make success impossible. Miraculously, their color improved, just as Courage said that it would, and in time, they awoke. How do you feel? Carmen asked. Terrible. Wretched. Kerr says that you'll be fine soon. If not for him, you might both be dead. Thanks. It was my fault that it happened. We don't blame you, Kerr, Carmen said. Down here in the dark, we trust you with our lives. I won't fail you again. I swear it. I just need to remember. It's been so long since I've tunneled. Everyone knew that he meant it beyond all question. We'll camp here until everyone's ready, Carmen said. Kayla... Where does the scepter point now? Its light flared, and the gem continued to point southward in the direction of their descent. How far down are we now, Kerr? We're several hundred feet beneath the base of the mountain. Somehow, Karina said, I think that we're going to travel far deeper before we're through. <clears throat> Glowing mushrooms. Once they recovered their strength, Kerr led the way. The stairs ahead of them were merely the beginning of an immense spiraling stair descending through the rock. One hundred steps and they had reached its end. 
an eerie glow spilled through an arched doorway, framing the last few steps in a small landing. The archway opened into the space beyond. Kerr signaled for a halt and called Kalo forward with a whisper. They crept forward quietly, unsure what manner of beast might lie beyond that door. Peering within, expecting every imaginable horror, they were witness to a great vaulted garden of color. Hundreds of mushrooms and molds of various kinds covered the majority of the cavern floor. It was from these fungi that the phosphorescent glow emanated, and it illuminated the cavern surprisingly well. In fact, they could all see with a vivid clarity that they had not enjoyed since they had begun their subterranean adventure. The grand chamber descended gently for some one hundred feet, with a ceiling above them of similar height. The grotto ended with a roughly hewn stone stair, rising to meet an open passageway that led off toward the north. Thousands of bat hung tenaciously to the jagged ceiling, and their refuse had formed an enormous pile of black dung surrounding the distant staircase. When Kerr stepped into the cave, the bats flew out in a chaotic rush through a wide chimney in the cavern's roof. Piercing screeches and leathery wing beats filled the air with sound, but when they had finally gone, the empty void seemed deadly quiet. Moving in, Kerr examined the myriad forms of mushrooms that he found there. Great toadstools, green and mottled, lay all about the floor. As well as, an enormous, as well as enormous white mushrooms that were taller than he was. Drawing his belt knife, he carved great chunks out of the largest of the mushrooms and placed them in his food sack. These will keep for many days. We could survive indefinitely on these alone if we had to. Fill your packs, but don't touch the spotted toadstools. They're deadly poison. Despite his warning, and with an explanation, he placed three of them into his belt pouch with gloved hands. What do you want those for, Carmen asked. They have many uses. Without them, we can never make an antitoxin. I trust that their other uses are good ones, Kerr, but in the meantime, lead on. They followed closely behind him, like a group of school children at an outdoor lesson. He then taught them what he could about mushroom lore. I know the names and properties of over a thousand varieties of fungi. I can see over a hundred types in this cave alone. This wrinkled green fungus here will keep a wound from festering if it is made into a poultice, and it can cure many diseases if fashioned into a tea. Then we should take some with us, Karina said while collecting some. This stuff could come in handy down here. These red mushrooms will cure a headache or other pains, and these black-capped toadstools will keep women barren if made into a tea. Carrying the knowledge of his people, he knew the beasts of the deep and wilds, and plants that grew without light like none other. He led them through the cavern, and they collected many useful specimens. Halfway across it, they came upon a great watery mass of bat guano. Notice the slope of the cavern floor and the angle of the far stairs. I would estimate that this muck is at least eight feet deep at its center. We will have to work our way around it along the cave's outer wall. The refuse should be shallower there. Let's move out, Carmen said, but be ready for anything. I've got a bad feeling about this. <clears throat> Kerr took the point position. Halfway through the stinking refuse, it seemed that his guess was right, because the filth was only six inches deep. They were only forty feet from the stone stair when the Beast of Horror struck. And that's where we'll begin episode four, with a chapter titled A Fistful of Dung on page 39. Thank you for listening. Have a great night. And as always, read part two of the Duard Hume Staff Saga, The Drums of Doom, part two, by me and the following novels. Thank you and have a great night.